realize uh, Lucas was doing this uh, awesome seminar series, lecture series for you guys, which is really, really cool. Uh, I completely agree with everything he said. We need more developers. We badly need more developers. Part of the reason I'm going on the tour right now is because I need to hire developers. Um, so this talk is going to be highly, highly technical. So I apologize to all of you who, who are less technical. Um, you can fall asleep after the first three slides. So. The rest of you sign up for Lucas's talk. I, I noticed uh, my friend um, uh, Eric Boskel in there. I saw some slides with Schnorr signatures on there, which would be this talk too. <laughs> so, um, all right, so on chain defense in depth. Uh, the, the basic idea here is uh, to add new tools on the blockchain. It gives us more powerful control over our Bitcoins um, and more powerful tools to create secure custody. Okay. So the basic idea is that you have this, uh, this vault, right? So a vault is, is time locked, right? If you want to take anything out of the vault, you have to wait a certain amount of time. Now, if you have a, a custody operation, right, you don't need to move all your funds immediately, ever, right? You want these timed processes. And in fact, any custodian will have some form of uh, vaulted time locked thing where there's a procedure whereby people have to go in into the vault and, and get the funds and move them out, right? And there's, you know, there's multiple layers of authorizations, multiple people, multiple locations involved in, in actually moving the funds. So we want to mimic that on, on Bitcoin. And the way the, the vault basically works is there's, uh, there's three phases here. So let's imagine Alice is a, is a customer of a, of a service provider. A service provider could be a custodian, an exchange, um, or you know, anybody who's doing anything with Bitcoin really where you're providing service to somebody else, right? So Alice is your customer and Bob is your customer. Um, any Alice's here, by the way? No? Okay. Why is Bob wearing this skirt? Because I originally had it the other way around, but Alice should come before Bob and I forgot to change the icons, that's why. Um, so the, uh, I'm Bob. <laughs> so, yeah, Bob's wearing a skirt today, apologize. Uh, so the, uh, the vault um, is time locked, right? So funds can't move out of the vault for a certain amount of time. So when you send a transaction to the chain that moves the funds out of the vault, you have to wait a certain amount of time. So when Bob slash Alice comes to withdraw some funds, um, there's, a, there's a, a wait here in, implied in, in the process. During this wait time, there's another alternative process here that does not have a time lock. And it's what we term a clawback. Um, and the point is that we're actually using the blockchain to enforce this. Uh, so during this, this unlocking time, the, the owner has the possibility to send funds to another address, which evades the time lock. The idea here is that if somebody gets into your cold storage and steals your private keys, right, they still can't steal the funds because they have to wait this time lock. And you have this other, other alternative. So this is why it's defense in depth. We're giving ourselves lots of opportunities, lots of options to save our, save our funds or save our customers' funds. Um, so the clawback is this alternative, alternative spend here, right? So we're, we, during this time, we're waiting for the funds to, hit the, to be available to be sent to another person. We can send it back to ourselves if we have a, like a backup cold storage here, um, thereby preventing a theft. So um, the, the, there are two pieces to this. The first piece of this is basically an if-else statement, right? Um, so this, First branch here, which says, I'm going to wait the block height plus 72. This is a 12 hour time lock, right? Um, and I'm going to check this lock time. Uh, after that lock time, if uh, the, you know, the hot pub key, so I'm sending from my hot to my cold, if the hot pub key is used to sign something, then we, okay, then we can send it on to the customer, right? This is the normal flow of operation. Um, but then there's this other clause here, right? This is my emergency get out of jail free card, right? So if, if these keys get stolen, if the cold or hot keys get stolen, I want to execute this clause, uh, which sends my, which I can use to send my funds to safety. Um, if, for those of you that are familiar with Lightning, this is backwards from, with respect to Lightning. Lightning has a, a similar structure in that it, it's got an if else with a time lock, but the time lock is the, um, the unusual condition. The time lock is the, um, uh, what do you call it? adversarial close of the payment channel, whereas the, the non-time locked one is the, the normal condition. So the challenge of this vault mechanism is that we want to enforce that 
these funds in this first branch is going to us. This is an internal movement. We're moving from hot to cold. We want to enforce that it's going from something that we control to something that we control, right? And that's, that's what makes this difficult. And that's what basically the rest of the talk is about. So um, some general features about this, after which most of you can fall asleep. Um, the remainder of this talk, I'm going to go into some, some details about how to actually do this. Um, so, so there's some features of this vault mechanism, what's mentioned. Uh, there are two transactions here, right? The first one sends it from the vault to this unlocked address. Um, this starts a clock, right? It gets mined. That mined block has a time in it. That's the beginning of a clock. The 72 blocks I had in my last slide uh, is the end of the clock, right? So I don't know when my attacker is going to show up. I don't know when he's going to try and steal my funds, but I want that to start a clock. And the blockchain does that for me. By getting that transaction mined, it starts the clock, and then I, he has to wait out this, this time period. Um, and this is one way to understand why two transactions are actually required for this, is that we have, we have to start a clock and we have to end the clock. And the only clock we have is Bitcoin, right? Me and the attacker or me and the rest of the world are not generally going to agree upon the clock. Bitcoin, I, I like to think of as the world's worst clock, but it's very trustable. You, you, can't, you can't falsify the time very easily. Um, so the blockchain is the clock here, right, that is enforcing this. Um, we term this alternative non-tomlock branch a clawback. Um, during this time, you have the opportunity to watch the blockchain for your own addresses and see an unvaulting that you didn't create. Yeah. Uh, so in the first, uh, were you actually sending it to the time locked place? That needs, that requires, that, does that require two signatures? I, it can, doesn't have to. I mean, it depends where it's coming from. Okay, but okay, well, can, if a hacker obtains the, the private key of the first address, can he just send it somewhere else? No. So that's the entire rest of the talk. Why can't he send it somewhere else, right? So generally when you get a hold of a private key, you can send funds anywhere you want, right? Um, the whole point of a vault is that to create an encumbrance where the next transaction has a restriction on it. So that's, that's not a normal thing to do in Bitcoin. There's no simple way to do that. If I were to come up with a solution to that, you would say, oh, okay, let's, let's put it in a multisig. Let's um, um, sign one of the outputs with a private key and let, then, then let me throw the private key away. And then I'll just have the other private key. That address. is one of the solutions that's I have here. That's how I would do it. That is, that is number two and three slides to come. Uh, all right, so, so the idea is that these clawback keys are not your cold storage keys. They are more held more securely and they're used less often, right? So I've got many layers of keys here. I've got hot keys, I've got cold keys, and then I've got these emergency escape hatch keys. Oops. Um, so these, these clawback keys are another set of keys you have to, to manage, right? So we're adding more and more layers of defense here. Um, also, so if you actually executed this and you saw somebody trying to, to, to steal your funds here, you need a place to send everything, right? You, you need to already have prepared a backup, uh, a backup cold storage in case of this emergency. All right, so that's, uh, that's basically the, the introduction into the whole mechanism. Um, I would kind of prefer to take questions if you guys wouldn't mind, because I'm going to get into the weeds after this. So if you have questions on the construct or the, the basic idea. Yeah, so just to simplify sort of the, 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 sort of the scenario here, what is the, the, the vulnerability model here? Uh, Who is stealing what private keys? Anybody stealing the private keys that are used by the service provider. An exchange's private keys, a custodian's private keys. If those keys get stolen, right? So you have a, a vault where the private keys are stored in the cold storage, correct? Yep. And on top of that, you have a 72 hour 72 block timer. Yeah. So if my cold storage is broken and the keys, the hacker wants to send somewhere else, the funds, they have to wait the 72 block times. Correct. And during this time, you detect this activity on the blockchain. Correct. And then you transfer the funds to your secondary vault. I think that's the whole concept your premises is based Basically. upon. All right? Yes. So, sorry, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Uh, so if I were a smart hacker, I wouldn't do it right away. I would wait until like the one block before 
the uh, the expiration of the time lock? Um, yes. Just just to minimize the amount of time you have to do the clawback. Yeah. So th there's another way to do this, and that is that um, if someone stole your private keys. Uh, they have the private keys, you have the private keys, you can both write transactions. So if I wait until that very last block, I'm in the same situation as if they had just stolen my private keys and I didn't have this mechanism. And in that case, the only thing I can do is I can play a game of increasing the fees to try and uh, make my transaction have high, higher priority than his. I want to avoid that game. That's, an, that's the entire purpose of the time lock. So when you get to that last, that last block and you're at number 72, the game's over. I've lost my ability to uh, to withdraw everything. But the the point is that the um, this first transaction, the unvaulting transaction, was created by me, and I know it was created by me. If it's created by an attacker, I know it's created by an attacker. Um, that that's that's the assumption here, right? So if it's created by the attacker, I, I and I know that it is, I can I can take action long before the the time runs out. Um, if the attacker is going to wait all seventy two blocks. It must be the case that he did not create the unvaulting transaction. So what if the attacker waits until you do a usual uh, transaction and then he's kind of waiting the, uh, the, 72, hour, the 72 hours um, and he's waiting until the end of the transaction. Since you made the transaction, you're not suspicious. Mm -hmm. And if he has the, the, your hotkeys, the hotkeys for the transaction, um, then he should be able to to then surprise you and you won't have time for the clawback. That's right. So um, there is a, there's a hot wallet here, right, that does not have this protection. And, you know, it, getting into exactly how you use this tool to construct your wallet is, there's a lot of design decisions there um, that I, I don't want to get into. I, I mean, just for simplicity's sake, let's say there's a hot wallet that does not have this protection on it. And you're completely right. If you get the hot wallet keys, you can steal everything in the hot wallet. But you've, by, by having a hot wallet in the first place, you've minimized your risk there by not keeping a lot of funds in it at any given time. Um, the cold wallet, however, is still susceptible to the same attack if you, get the, if you can manage to get the private keys. Um, and your hot wallet here doesn't even have to be online, right? We could be talking about a, a set of keys which have no time lock, but the keys are actually offline. So it's such that I can make an almost immediate transaction. It's not seconds, but it's 30 minutes as opposed to 12 hours. Um, sorry, I didn't quite follow the point you said. So there's a there's a unvaulting step. Yep. Can can you can you understand what you mean by the unvaulting step? That that is prior to the unlock, right? The unlock. Uh, the unvault triggers the the, is the unlock, right? Ah. The unvaulting step is when I send from the the UTXO that is the vault to an unlocked address. Yes. Right. So after so this is a transaction, right? From the vault to unlock, um, and that transaction once it's mined begins the clock. Mm. At the end of that clock, I, so I can't spend this unlocked UTXO until the end of that clock, unless I execute this mechanism, right? Um, so the, this is a tr the, the unvaulting is a transaction that moves it to a new address. After 70, 72 hours, I can use it to use the, use the hotkeys to spend it and send it to a customer. So I detect that I've been compromised at some point in time, and then I, I trigger that uh, uh, transaction, and I claw back during the 72 Yes block or hour time period okay you are constantly taking a, keeping an eye on the on the blockchain for your addresses that's right you run your own blockchain explorer yes okay and any service provider every exchange is right they'll have many bitcoin nodes and many ways of, of doing this true i mean this is not good for your personal wallet right <laughs> this is too complicated <laughs> and you need to be online so the 72 hours in the block, where is that transaction, where is that wait time built into? It's built into this, uh, so this is the unlocked address, where the, uh, so it's, it's built in here. Now, what I'm failing to understand is, you have my UTXO, right? And you're trying to send it to another address. So where does the 72 hour, 72 block restriction is coming from? It's, it's, in the, it's in the script, right? So this is a, a pay to script hash, um, and the script is the hash of this script, right? So when I spend this, when I spend this address, which is the unlocked address, 72 blocks have to have passed since the previous transaction was, since this transaction sending to this address was mined, right? Um, and th then I can spend it using this set of keys. Got it. 
Thanks. So um, I understand there is an, an underlying assumption that the clawback key is somehow handled differently so that this yes. one remains secure while the other one is stolen. So what is that difference in the handling? You don't use it, right? So, so the cold keys have to be used on a regular basis to satisfy withdrawals, right? Um, the callback keys are emergency only. You'd only pull it out in case of a theft attempt. Um, so by virtue of the fact that they are more difficult to get access to and they're not used in your regular business process, it's very difficult to discover how they, you know, how they actually work. Okay. Yeah, basically, I guess what you could do was that you could generate the private key of the clawback on a cold computer and then calculate the public key from the private key yeah. and transfer the public key to a hot computer. Yes, exactly. The question in the back here. I have one, thank you. Um, I'm wondering, does it show on the blockchain, respectively on, on, the, on the key, if it is locked, if this mechanism is, no. is active? No, because the, the only thing that appears on the blockchain is uh, the address, right? And the address is the hash of a script. So it's not until somebody attempts to spend this that they reveal the whole script. So by spending it, it changes, and I, as a hacker, I recognize it. I have to wait 20, uh, 72 blocks. Yes. Okay. So it, it is. A, so I'm going to talk a bit about Taproot in a few slides, um, but it is a fact here that everyone would see that your your sends are time locked. Thank you. Even with Taproot. All right. Everybody's got it, right? Okay. So the trick with this entire thing is enforcing that both of these addresses are mine, right? So I have the, the vaulted address, uh, which Alice deposited to, Alice who does not wear skirts. Um, and then I have the, uh, the unlocked address, uh, which is also under my control. So all, all the keys involved in both of those addresses are mine. Um, and the, the difficult thing is enforcing this relationship between the vaulted address and the unlocked address. Because generally, if you have private keys, you can send to any address. Right? And this is how uh, thieves are able to immediately steal Bitcoin funds if they get access to the private keys. So um, this all started in 2016 with this paper by uh, Ite Eyal, uh, Iman Gutsayer, and uh, Moser um, called Bitcoin uh, Covenants. Right? So uh, the covenant, as they describe it, is the restriction on the following transaction. Right. Um, shortly thereafter, I came up with a way to do this, which you just came up with, um, of using a pre-signed transaction to do this, uh, which I'll talk about. Um, there's another proposal by Johnson Lau uh, called Push TX Data, where you essentially push various information about a transaction onto the stack. Um, and finally, there's a, there's, there is a mechanism called Check Sig from Stack, where you can use a signature check on the stack to, to do the same thing. So all, all four of these are mechanisms to enforce that I'm moving from a vaulted address I control to an unlocked address that I control. And so my purpose in giving this talk is to raise this topic. This is a valuable tool that we, we could be using in this space. We cannot use it today. Um, there are four proposals now on how to do it. Uh, I think the, 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 there is more work that needs to be done on this, and I hope to encourage some of that work so that we can build more secure custody solutions. Checksig from stack, is it the same as the checksig verify that's, that exists on my cache? Yes. Okay. Um, all right, so the way the, the first paper on this worked, so this is uh, ETAEL and collaborators, check output verify. So they created a new opcode. And the idea here is that um, it, it takes as parameters an index, a value, and a pattern. Um, and it checks the, uh, a particular output and, and tries to put a restriction on it. Um, I don't think I really want to read through all of the logic here, uh, but it's, it's kind of like a regular expression in that you can put any pattern you want uh, on the following transaction, which makes it very powerful but also kind of dangerous, um, in that there can be lots of unintended consequences with it. Um, this, this particular idea, I think, hasn't really gone very far since the initial paper. Um, they also talk a lot about Bitcoin covenants, which is a recursive use of this. Um, when you use an opcode like this, you can also uh, not only encumber the following transaction, but encumber the next transaction and the next one, and in fact, infinitely after that. You can make recursive covenants. Um, so th this, is, this was the, the pattern that uh, originally came out. Um, 
I haven't seen anybody follow up on this particular proposal as far as like making a BIP or actually making a pull request to Bitcoin. Um, but that, that was the first one. Um, I'm going to talk mostly about the, the mechanism that I came up with, which is the, the pre-signed transaction. Um, if you have a, a pre-signed transaction, you don't necessarily need uh, an opcode to do it, right? I'm, if I can control how the pre-signed transaction gets created, I can control that the funds go from an address I control to another one. As long as I'm, I, I'm sure that I have created the transaction, that's the only transaction that could exist. So the idea here is that when you give someone a deposit address, um, instead of giving them a, a public key to which you have uh, the private key or an address corresponding thereto, um, you randomly generate a new private key. And you calculate this public key and you give this as the address. Um, from there, you create and pre-sign a transaction that sends it from the vault to the unlocked address. So this is like a one in, one out um, uh, transaction. Then you delete the key. So at the point that I've deleted the key, this transaction is the only way the funds can move if I think I've deleted the key. Um, and then once I've done that, I can give this, uh, this vaulted address to uh, Alice to deposit. Um, this pre-signed transaction depends upon the input transaction ID. So we must wait for Alice to deposit before signing. So we have to hold this private key for a period of time until Alice actually sends the transaction. Um, this means the key can't be deleted for some time during which it's vulnerable. Uh, if, if, you, if someone can figure out how to get around this mechanism and take the private key from this, uh, the randomly generated private key, they can get around the vault mechanism entirely. Um, there's an alternative to this, and that is that instead of creating a private key and deleting it, um, we can create a, a transaction that sends from the vaults to the unlocked, uh, and instead of creating a private key, we'll create a signature using a random number generator. And within um, uh, ECDSA uh, signing, you can actually compute the public key uh, from the signature. Um, so we'll randomly create a signature, we'll compute the public key, from that we'll compute an address, and then we'll give that to Alice. So by doing that, we never had the private key in the first place. And again, we enforce that this is the only thing that can happen, is that it moves from, from this vault address that I control to this unlocked address that I control. Um, this requires a uh, sig hash no input. So sig hash no input is a new uh, signing mechanism, a signing flag that was proposed along with the Lightning Network. Um, and the idea is that uh, it, it doesn't bind itself to a particular output. So you can change which, uh, which transaction, which output, which UTXO this is tied to. Um, the problem with this is that uh, the sig hash depends upon the input transaction ID, which depends upon the previous transaction's output address, which depends upon the pub key. So you have a circular dependency between the, uh, the public key, which is hashed into an address, and the public key, which is needed for signing. You can't satisfy this without breaking the hash function. So what we need here is that somehow the, uh, this transaction we're creating doesn't actually depend upon this pub key because otherwise I'm going to create a, a circular dependency. And therefore, we need sig hash no input to do this. Um, all right, so I'm going to get into the little weeds a little bit. I'll give you guys a little bit more context. I hope I'm not losing the entire audience. Uh, so what is, what is a sig hash? Um, sig hash is the thing that gets signed effectively in a Bitcoin transaction. Um, basically, what you do is you take a bunch of data from the uh, uh, from the transaction and you just concatenate it all together and then you hash it and then your signature is on that data, right? And what you're doing by doing that is you're committing to uh, a bunch of information about the transaction. So I'm committing to this version, the previous outputs, the, the sequence number, um, the, pre the out points, the, the, uh, the transaction ID and outputs of the inputs to this transaction, um, the script code, which is my, my uh, um, uh, the scripts in the previous transactions, et cetera, et cetera, right? The idea is that nobody can change any of these things. You can't take one transaction signature and apply it to a different transaction. Um, and that's the point of doing all this. You put, all, you put as much data as you can in here to prevent people from reusing signatures and taking them somewhere else. So in the following slides, you'll see M. Uh, this is the message that is used uh, in signature algorithms, right? It's all of this hashed together. Um, Number 10, sig hash is a byte that gets appended to this whole thing that tells you how, uh, how you want to construct the rest of this. Um, common ones are all, in other words, I'm going to sign all inputs and all outputs in a transaction. Um, single, which means I'm signing one input, one output. Um, 
anyone can pay, which means I don't care what the input is. Um, and no input is, in, is, that's where no input belongs here, is that this um, number 10 can be no input, which would be a new flag that says, I don't care what the previous outputs are. Right? I don't care what the input is to this transaction. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be able to take this transaction and move it around, move its inputs around. And you want this for the Lightning Network. This is what enables uh, submarine swaps and splicing, where I can uh, add funds into a channel uh, or remove them from a channel. Uh, without having to make an on-blockchain transaction. Because what I, what I do is I just rearrange which transaction, um, which uh, UTXOs are, are used for this particular Lightning channel. Um, all right. So the, one of the other things that's happening in the Bitcoin community right now is the Schnorr uh, BIP has been proposed. It was on Lucas's slides a few minutes ago, um, being taught in his, his lectures. So the Schnorr signature algorithm is, a, is an uh, alternative to the uh, elliptic curve digital sig signature algorithm, ECDSA. Um, it has a lot of advantages. Uh, people really like Schnorr for mathematical reasons. It has security proofs. Um, they like it for aggregation reasons because you can take multiple Schnorr signatures and just add them together and they're still a valid signature. So you can do uh, what's called batch validation. So I can take a whole lot of data and validate it all at the same time very, very quickly. So. It's expected that this uh, that Schnorr is going to be a part of the uh, the changes coming to Bitcoin probably this summer when we get a new uh, a new soft fork. Um, the proposal that is out there right now is the in the BIP that's been written by Peter Willa um, is is the following essentially. So a signature a Schnorr signature looks like this. You have um, S times G. So S S and R are your the the signatures, right? So each of these is a thirty two byte. Uh, blob of data, basically. G is an elliptic curve point. It's the uh, the base point. Um, and then I have a hash of some data, and I'm constructing this hash in such a way to prevent people from doing certain kinds of arithmetic on signatures. Um, so I'm putting the R value as well as the pub key as well as the message in here to prevent people from uh, basically subtracting off my own pub key and putting in their own. Um, so the problem with this is that this, uh, as proposed, uh, the Schnorr BIP has exactly the same problem I described earlier in terms of making a circular dependency between your pub keys. Because uh, Peter has chosen to put the pub key uh, in here, uh, in the signature algorithm. There's an alternative scheme which he discusses in his BIP, which does not have the, the pub key in here. The problem with this is, with this other alternative scheme, any third party can take one of your signatures uh, and malleate it into another valid signature for the same message. So. What this means is that, um, so is, is this okay, right? Could this ever be okay, right? I took all that data in the, um, in the SIG hash and I put all this data in there to prevent people from mucking with my signatures and taking my transactions and making their, their own, right? Um, could this ever be okay? This, this is a, a way to take my signature and turn it into something else. Could this be useful to a thief? Um, whether this is okay reduces to the question of are there transactions with exactly the same M message, meaning SIG hash, right? But that's exactly what we wanted to do in the first place, right? We wanted to be able to move around the inputs, um, which means that the rest of it can in principle be the same. So unfortunately, in general, yes. Uh, so if you imagine a service operator and I have clients sending money in, right? Uh, one of the things that is common in financial services is that people will move funds in tranches. If you're moving a lot of money, you don't move it all at once. You move it in, in batches. Um, so if you imagine a customer uh, sending 100 Bitcoins at a time, uh, let's say they have 1,000 Bitcoins, they're gonna move 100 Bitcoins 10 times, right? Um, they may essentially create uh, a situation where you have the same SIG hash. This occurs through address reuse. Um, and this is something that's out of our control, right? So if we give a customer an address and they choose to send the first tranche and then the second tranche to the same address, um, I've created a situation where if I, if I use SIG hash no input, the transactions that are constructed to move those funds will be identical. Or rather, the, the, what is signed to create the signature will be identical. So this isn't good. Um, however, I, I, I still really like this idea for a couple of reasons. Um, so you, these pre-signed transactions you create are interesting objects. You can think about them like gold bars, right? It's a piece of data. It by itself is not really funds. It's not, it doesn't confer control of the funds. Separate from this pre-signed transaction is a, is a private key off somewhere, right? And I need, to, uh, I need to have the private key and I need to obey the time locks in order to be able to move those funds. 
Um, so these objects are, are kind of cool. Um, you know, I could give them to a custodian. I could give them to my auditor or something like that. But that the, the person I give them to to hold doesn't actually have control of the funds at all. I'm just asking them to back them up for me, sort of. Um, so this is an interesting tool that could be used in a, in a risk management policy. Um, these objects are less risky than keys, right? Uh, a private key that confers direct control of funds is a much more risky object than this pre-signed transaction. Um, these, these objects can't be directly stolen. In fact, I could redundantly back them up and have many copies of them, right? And if one of them gets sent to the blockchain, I would know it. Um, and it can be redundantly backed up. But there are many downsides to this, this particular proposal. Um, let's imagine there's a responsible hard fork, right? So we all saw Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin SV go bananas in the last year. Um, several of those were irresponsible hard forks that did not have replay protection, which means that the same transaction is, is valid on both of the blockchains. Um, if the same transaction is valid on both of the blockchains, uh, you know, this causes lots of problems because um, customers may think they're sending one asset and they're actually sending a different asset. Um, this is not acceptable in the financial world. If the customer thinks they're sending dollars and they're actually sending euros, this is somewhat of a disaster for the customer. We don't want this at all. Um, so if, let's say in the future, there is a responsible hard fork that implements replay protection, that implements an address format that is different for this new, new coin, right? Um, implements a new proof of work function so they don't cause a 51% attack uh, problem. Um, if they did that and it were responsible, I would not be able to use my pre-signed transaction on this new chain. I would have lost those funds. I would not be able to claim those funds on the new fork. So that's a drawback. Um, as a service provider, uh, you know, if you're an exchange or you're a custodian, those aren't your funds. They're somebody else's, right? And you have a legal obligation to give them access to those funds. So this is bad. Um, secondly, deleting of keys is generally not done. Um, if you talk to cyber people at any big company, they will tell you we don't ever delete keys. There's a, there's a super secret vault where they take old keys and throw them away. Disagree? <laughs> okay. Um, but I mean, this entire idea revolves around the ability to delete keys in the first place. Um, and then, then there's a question of how do you know you actually deleted a key, right? Uh, does, did my hardware actually delete it? I don't know. Maybe. Uh, there are hardware and software attacks that can evade the vault mechanism. Um, SIG hash no input is unsafe if there's any form of address reuse. Um, and unfortunately, this is not something that you can control. Uh, if a customer has an address, they can send to it multiple times, and they may choose to, even if we tell them not to. Um, in addition to you know, moving things in tranches, uh, penny tests are a common phenomenon. People will send a small amount of funds just to make sure that all the wires are connected right and we can actually move things. Um, and this causes address reuse, uh, even if we told the customer not to do that. It's their, it's their funds, it's their mechanism, it's their movement when they're sending to an address. It's not something we control. Um, so this pre prevent, presents a lot of ways that uh, signatures could be replayed in, in principle. Um, wh whether or not to create these tranches is the sender's decision and policy. No matter what we do, we can't 100% prevent that. There's also something called dusting attack attacks, where certain three-letter agencies may send very small amounts of Bitcoin to addresses they see on the blockchain just to see if it moves again to try and correlate wallets. Um, and if you spent one of those, this would be a similar situation where you've now created a signature that could be modified by someone else. All right. So that's the pre-signed transaction story. Um, option number three was prevented by, presented by Johnson Lau a few years ago. Uh, he has this op code he calls op push TX data. Um, and the idea here is it's basically a Swiss army knife. We're in Switzerland. I can say Swiss army knife, right? Um, that just takes random data out of the transaction and puts it on the stack, which lets you do computation on it then. Um, this uh, seems to be created to enable essentially arbitrary computation on the transaction data. This is very Ethereum-like, really. Um, this is not generally the favored approach by most Bitcoin developers. Um, the statement by most of the Bitcoin devs is that you don't actually want a general purpose state machine that can do arbitrary computation. You want verifiability. I want to know that the, the spend is, is authorized, but not do a, a computation. Um, so I, I, this particular proposal, I think, uh, hasn't really gone anywhere. Um, but just in, in, for the sake of completeness, I, I throw it in. Um, and I, I think it's kind of counter to Bitcoin's philosophy and also has the problem that 
there are a lot of funny things you could do here. Um, if you, if you can pick apart a transaction like this and then do computation in a script, there are many funny things you can do that I, I fear the more complex means of doing this may end up with uh, lost funds because somebody has unintended consequences in a recursive script or something like that. Lastly, um, there is this op check sig from stack. So as, as mentioned, this is the same op code that is on um, uh, Bitcoin Cash now. It's also been implemented in the, the liquid and Elements Alpha uh, sidechains from Blockstream. Um, so in, in that regard, it's, it's probably the most favorable of, of these options. Um, this is what a program looks like to check it. Basically what's going on here is that you are, you're putting the signature on the stack and you have a new op code um, check sig from stack. You're checking the signature twice here. The first time you're checking that the signature on the stack is, is uh, validates. And secondly, you're, you're doing a regular check sig verify, which is checking the signature on this actual transaction. So by doing so, if A validates and B validates, that means A is equal to B. And this is actually the transaction you intended to create this uh, relationship between unlock and vault. Um, all of these opcodes can create recursive covenants, uh, which kind of scares me a little bit. Um, again, this, uh, this talk is intended to spur discussion and thought about like, how do we actually do this correctly. The recursive covenants, uh, on the one hand, might be very powerful. You could do interesting things with them. On the other hand, I fear that uh, people will unintentionally create recursive covenants and then not be able to get out of them, which is something to think about. Um, another thing about using these opcodes like this is that it's fairly obvious to everyone that you're actually making a vault. Yeah. Does this solution mean that you put a signature into the redeem script or the... Yes. Yeah. Or the uh, script um, pub? Script pub key. Got it. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So you've got your program, which is your script hash, right? Uh, and you've got the initial stack, which is your script pub key. Um, so yeah, you put a signature directly there. And the second one here is your sig hash, um, the hash of your transaction data. Uh, yeah, so you put those directly on the stack. Um, and then you, then, then you validate them. Um, all right. Uh, so one of the consequences of this that's kind of funny is that you probably want to, you'll probably find yourself in a situation where you want to make a new wallet that only deals with fees. Um, Lightning is having the same problem right now. You know, between the time you create a Lightning channel and you close the Lightning channel, the fee situation can be different. And so you need a, a means to change the fee. And so the, the way I describe these unlocked transactions, it's basically a one-in, one-out transaction. Um, you don't know the fee at the time you do it. So what you really want to do is compose that with another wallet that only pays fees. Um, all right. Let's see what I wanted to hear. All right, only two more slides. Um, the, the next thing you want from something like this is the ability to hide the fact that you're doing it. Uh, yeah. Can you elaborate on the concept of another wallet only paying the fees? Yes. So when you construct a transaction, you have these SIG hash flags, right? Uh, if I go back to the SIG hash. Um, you have the SIG hash flags here, number 10, right? So the, this list of data um, includes the previous output in the out point. So this is the transaction ID and index of the input transaction, right? Um, there can be more than one of these. You can have two inputs or five inputs, right? Um, the sig hash, uh, if it's all, takes all of those inputs and just smash them all together, right? If it's single, if it's none, I include none of them. If it's single, I include one of them. So if I have this one input, one output transaction, I can take that and with this separate wallet, as long as that one input, one output is signed with sig hash single, right? I can add another input that is a fee, another output that is a change from my fee, right? Now I have a two input, two output transaction with an appropriate fee, but... Um, the, the, the covenant or the, the, the vault transaction doesn't sign the wallet piece because it doesn't have the keys anyway. The, the wall, the, sorry, the fee wallet does not have the keys for the, the vaulted transactions. Um, so you want to be able to compose uh, a transaction with essentially a fee. Make sense? Okay. All right, so the last piece of the puzzle I'm going to talk about here is um, it would be really cool if you had a way to hide the fact that you were doing this. Um, because 
if you come back to this, uh, this script I had earlier, um, if you're doing this, every single person will see this script in every single transaction you make, which is kind of not good because they will see, oh, well, there's this other way to spend this person's funds and it involves two keys. And now, I can, now as a thief, I can go try to establish where are those keys, right? And I know there's two of them, so I gotta, I'm going to go and try to find those. It would be really cool if nobody could see that I was doing that at all or the, what the policy was. So that's where Taproot comes in. So Taproot was proposed early last year um, by uh, Greg Maxwell. What it is, is a, a mechanism to take your public key and you tweak it. Tweak in this, uh, this world means just add, it's just addition. Sometimes I think Greg Maxwell is the only person that can do arithmetic. Um, but basically you take your public key and you add to it uh, M times G, where M is uh, the Merkle root of a Merkle abstract syntax tree. Anybody know, know here what Merkle abstract syntax trees are? Mast? One person. Okay. Um, let me describe that real quick. Uh, so, what a, what a Merkle abstract syntax tree is, is that instead of writing something like this as an if-else statement, right, I can consider this to be uh, two branches of a binary tree. So I have the, the first statement could be the left branch of my binary tree, and the else could be the right branch of the binary tree. And then all I need to do when I'm spending this is tell the, the state machine which branch I'm spending. And so I need to commit to both branches, because I could have spent either one. Um, but when I, when I actually spend it, I say, oh, I'm spending the left one, here's the right one, that I, the hash of the right one that I'm not spending, um, and here's the script. So you take your, your, uh, your logic, and this can be arbitrarily complicated logic. I could have nested if else all kinds of stuff, right? And I convert it into a tree format, um, and then I hash it all together and I make a Merkle root. So that Merkle root now commits to this entire logic structure. And I can reveal any branch of this logic structure without re revealing any of the rest of it. Um, so the idea then with Taproot is that I can have a, a tree of all kinds of other logic that I could do if I wanted to, but I'm not going to do it most of the time. These are emergency conditions that are used rarely, but I want it to be in there. So this is a, an example of an optimistic protocol. So most of the time what I do is I'm, I'm just going to take this, I'm going to let the time walk expire, and I'm going to send it to the person who requested a withdrawal, right? Um, but the back out is there. And what, what this does is by tweaking my public key this way, it's just another public key. Nobody can tell that, any, that I did this because it just, it's just a public key. Um, where I've got a, the, the mast tree has uh, various alternatives, including the, the else spend there. Um, and as long as I have the private key for this, I can also sign for this tweaked version where I've tweaked my public key because I'll just do the same thing in my private key this, as well. Um, and when we spend this, we reveal which, which alternative, which branch of this tree we're doing. We reveal the script in that branch. Um, and the remaining non-executed branches are private. This is an optimistic protocol. Um, and the really fascinating thing about this is that the transactions that result from this are indistinguishable from a one key pay to pub key hash type transaction, which is really, really good for privacy um, because all these transactions look, look alike now. Um, they, they're not going to look alike for this because of the time lock. Uh, but that, but uh, if, you don't, if you're not doing time lock type things, this is a very good privacy enhancement for Bitcoin because you can add all this stuff without, um, and everything begins to look like a pay to pub key hash, including multi-sig. Um, and so for this, for this vault I described, the default script would be like this with a check time lock and then this, just a check sig. All right, so I will conclude there. Um, you guys can wake up now. <laughs> so vaults are a powerful tool. A lot of people on the Bitcoin ecosystem have wanted vaults for a long time. Um, I think the idea probably pre-existed the paper by Ite Iyal. Um, we don't have them yet. Uh, I hope I've given you a taste of what some of the issues are. Um, frankly, I'm not very happy with any of these alternatives <laughs> for various reasons. Um, but we definitely want this. Uh, my company wants it. I think many other custodians and service providers would want it. We definitely don't want money to be stolen. We want to secure our customers' funds. We want to use every tool we possibly can. Um, this definitely does require changes to Bitcoin to enable it and other blockchains too. So any, if any of you are working on other blockchains, think about this kind of construct and say, well, can this construct be created within the context of my blockchain? 
that will enable more secure custody and enable financialization of those assets. Um, to sum up some of what I said, there's undesirable things about pre-signed transactions. Don't know if you deleted the key. Um, if you're using uh, no input, third parties can potentially replay your signature if you reuse addresses, and this is kind of out of your control. Uh, but they have nice properties. Uh, if we could figure out a way to do this, we can treat these objects like gold bars, and we could build custody solutions around this particular blob of data that is less sensitive than a private key. I, I, I think we need a new idea here. So I throw it to you guys. Think hard. Um, of these new op codes, I, I'm most in favor of op check sig from stack. Um, again, it's got uh, two blockchains that are already using it, um, Liquid slash Elements Alpha, as well as Bitcoin's Cash. I'm not aware of any issues with it. Um, seems to be working fine in those. Um, it may require OpCat to also be enabled if you use that script before. Um, there are other use cases. Checking a signature is a very simple operation and a very common operation. And you might want to do that for various things inside of a script. Um, this is, it's much simpler than the Ethereum-like alternatives of uh, op check output verify or push TX data. It does enable recursive covenants, which I th think is something we should all think pretty hard about and whether we want that. Um, one thing I, I didn't get into very much is all of this makes batching very difficult. So everything I've described is a, essentially a one input, one output. Um, and what's, what's happening now is if you have one input, one output, you've essentially doubled the number of transactions you're creating on the chain. Um, this is bad for scalability. We would like the ability to kind of compose these in various ways. Um, but I've, by, by creating this covenant, you're preventing yourself from composing them. So more thought on that would be definitely interesting. All right, with that, I will finish up. This is supposed to be an animation. It's our new company, <laughs> Fidelity Digital Assets. Yep. Yeah, so regarding your, uh, your question about whether we can provably delete keys, I wonder if you could use a hardware security module. Certainly. Uh, where, you know, it, it actually gives you one-time use private keys. Except for the fact that the key has to be held for a while. Well, all it needs to do is uh, sign a transaction and, and provide you the hash. Right? But I have to know what to sign. So I have to wait for the depositor to send the transaction before I can sign it. So we're talking, this key has to live for 30 minutes, an hour, until the depositor actually sends his transaction. So yeah, if I could create the key and immediately delete it, that would be a much better situation. So create, sign, can't. delete. Yeah. Yeah, but I can't. Um, um, but, but you did give an alternative to that option where you don't, you don't um, uh, where you use actually a public key that is uh, instead of using uh, instead of, so you, you did give an alternative, I, I forgot how to describe it right now, but what is wrong with that alternative, where you're using a public key uh, that is not associated, you don't actually have a private key at all to delete? Because the, in order to do that, I have to have, uh, come back here. In order to do that, um, so I, I should have made a diagram for this. But you have, um, so I'm using the signature to calculate the public key. Input to the signature is the sig hash from the previous transaction, which contains a hash of that public key, of the same public key. So the, the public key appears in two places. It's the, the in the transaction ID in the hash, and also as an output of this signature ECDSA recover operation. So that's a circular dependency. And the only way I can satisfy that is if I could break my hash function. Uh, regarding check sig from stack, uh, you mentioned um, recur recursive covenants. Can you, I, I don't understand that, if you could elaborate a little bit. I can, um, the information that, so, so check sig from stack is checking the sig hash, which is this, right? Inside there is the script, script code, which is a script of the previous transaction, right? Oops. Um, yeah. I can use this to enforce that the script of the next transaction has a particular structure, and that structure can include a check sig from stack. So therefore, I can make a recursive covenant where the next transaction has to involve check sig from stack, which means the next one has to involve check sig from stack, which means the next one. <laughs> I 
I, I think this concept is confusing. I, I, and I think the implications need to be thought through carefully because I'm not sure we want that. Um, the paper by Ite Eyal uh, and Gunsayer, um talks about various situations in which that's beneficial. Um, I didn't go to the, into them here, but uh, they desire that for, for various reasons. So read that paper for uh, more on recursive covenants. So I can pose on the next application, pose Yep, exactly. So uh, the this, this scenario, which as I understand it, we're discussing here is um, a hot wallet that, um, that some hackers can steal the private keys to. A cold wallet to which the hackers obtain the private keys. I mean, okay. So, let's say, let's say, that, okay. Uh, I'm not sure that that that's. I, 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 I don't my, think. I, I'm not sure that distinction is relevant for my question. Yes. Um, let's say the hackers steal these private keys, and but they are they have a suspicion that the um, that the output that they can sign is this kind of. Um, mm -hmm. um, yeah, a time locked um, output. Can they just wait and see, okay, we'll just use the private keys once the next transaction has been, uh, has been published? Can they just play the waiting game and then uh, take the funds? Uh, two, two sets of keys here, two different attack vectors, right? So there's... Uh, so I'm not, so I'm not talking about them stealing the clawback keys. I'm talking about stealing yeah. the, the, the... Even the there, there's two sets oh, of keys. Oh, if you go right? one slide ahead... Uh, let's, they're stealing the hot pop key one and two. Yep. Um, so I'm not protecting it against that here. Um, this, this is a general construct, and you can say, all right, I'm going to build a complex wallet that does all kinds of things, and I want to put this time lock in the appropriate place. I'm not describing the full structure of a wallet and where exactly you'd put it. Um, I'll leave that to, for you to figure out. So two things. First of all, you, you said that there's one thing that's required for the Lightning Network. Uh, there's no input or, uh, yeah, so how does the Lightning Network work now since that's not yet? Uh... Lightning Network, um, because the Lightning Network is a protocol with very defined rules, it's not the case that people are going to be sending random data, r random amounts to your Lightning address. Right, so when you, when you open a payment channel with something, I'll, I'll use one of my TXOs, open a payment channel with you, you do the same, and at that point we have a, a payment channel we can push things back and forth through. The protocol doesn't allow for you to use, reuse that same address for another purpose. If you do, it would be dangerous, right? Um, so it's, it's uh, the responsibility of Lightning wallets to not reuse addresses if we get Sigash no input. And it's dangerous if they do reuse addresses. Isn't the, the same principle, doesn't it also apply to uh, votes in that uh, addressing the issue uh, of address reuse or uh, these kinds of things? Since that's run by a service provider and not by the clients, so you, you don't need to ask the clients not to reuse addresses, it's just you as a service provider have to avoid reusing the address and that issue then is addressed. Isn't that the case? That is possible. So if, if your customers are reusing addresses, you give them an address and they send you multiple times at that address. Another way around this is to essentially make a receiving wallet, right? And then all of this stuff is internal operations, including the vaulting itself. And so you, as part of your internal policy, may be able to handle that by sending it, by making that an internal send. But now I've added yet another on-blockchain step here. All right, now I've got a three-step uh, process uh, for, the, for the storage. And I'm using more and more blockchain space. <laughs> So it's possible. One last question by someone who hasn't asked a question all evening. <laughs> Hi. Um, so, very out of the, con the the rest of what has been said, this old-fashioned sheriff solution. Is there anything on the horizon that could tell you, yeah, maybe we get an international task force. We get the different jurisdictions working together, and yes, we could be calling this task force that something has been stolen, and there will be somebody taking care of that. I, d I don't think you need that. I mean, you can do this all yourself. 
You don't need somebody for that. So in other words, um, if you see your own funds being unvaulted unexpectedly, right? This is an internal, like a company's internal process, internal procedure, and then you execute this. I don't know that you'd want a third party to do it because then you're essentially giving third party, this third party access to all of your funds, <laughs> right? Okay. Thank you. Sure. Right. So thank you very much for you. coming tonight.